am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Left foot, Father Abraham had many sons. <laughs> many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. <laughs> you guys did good. Now you can sit down if you want to. But you, you know, it, it's kind of funny because we teach the kids this song. I learned a very, well, I learned it when I was teaching kids. So um, it wasn't one we did when I was a little kid, but it's one that, that I learned, you know, growing up. And, and we teach that song to children. One of the reasons we use that song, I'll be honest, is because as a teacher of small children, you want them to get all the wiggles out before lesson time, right? So that's, that's, that's the thinking of most preschool, early school age kids' teachers is that we're going to get the wiggles out. What they don't realize is that they're putting something in the spirit of the child. Through the motions, through the words, through putting it together. It's not just getting the wiggles out. But most of the time, we don't then teach them what that means, do we? So here we put it in their spirit. I'm a child of Avraham, right? But what does that mean? Avraham had a lot of sons, right? Well, biologically, he had two. And then after Sarah's death with Keturah, he had others. But he had the son of Hagar, the son of Ishmael. And by the way, a lot of people don't seem to know that after Sarah died, he had more kids. <laughs> he did. But the sons of promise, the son of promise. You know, it's kind of interesting because lineage is very important to God. The lineage, who begot who? Who begot who? Who begot who? There's lots of lists of that in the scripture, right? And I know a lot of times most of us just kind of skim through it, right? Because it's just a bunch of names. It's hard to do. And thank you, Chris. You did an excellent job with all those names. <laughs> that was phenomenal. <laughs> because sometimes those names aren't as easy as we would like them to be because they're not English. They're from another language. But the, but the lineage is extremely important to God. Otherwise, he wouldn't do that so often, right? It's the lineage, by the way, used in Matthew and used in Luke to support the Messiahship of Yeshua. To say, look, he is a son of David. He has a right to the kingship. He has a right to the throne in Jerusalem, right? Without that proper lineage, he would not have a right to the throne without that lineage. Lineage determines your role in the camp of Israel. Who your father is determines what you get to do and don't get to do in the household and in the whole process, right? If you are a son of Aaron, you get to be a priest and you get to go into the inner, inner part. And if you have followed the lineage right and you have kept yourself pure and you are the right age at the right time, you might even become the high priest and have the privilege, not just of offering the sacrifice on the altar, but of offering the ultimate sacrifice at Yom Kippur. If you are a son of Levi, but not a son of Aaron, you get to serve in the temple. You get to serve, you get to come, you get to clean things, you get to mop, mop the floors. Well, actually, they had dirt floors. But <laughs> you get to be the one to carry certain things when the, they marched. You got to be the one who made sure that can, the candles stayed burning, who trimmed the wicks of the menorah. You might even get to join the choirs. Because when David gathered everyone into Jerusalem, he set up the choirs by the sons of Merari. Did you know that? The choirs were Levites. If you wanted to be a choir in the tabernacle, you had to be the son or the daughter in a certain family. 
lineage determines your role. But what determines whether or not you are a house of the household of Israel? It isn't which tribe you're born into. It really isn't. You know, we think about that a lot. We think about our lineage. We think about the fact that, you know, there's there's 12 tribes. There's the sons and then daughters of these 12 tribes, and each one had a role. And every month we do Rosh Kodesh, and we do a, a gathering on the, on the Shabbat preceding the Rosh Kodesh, and we talk about the tribe of the month and what it means, what the blessings were given over that month, what happened in that. We do this. Um, and up on the wall there is where Janie has put it together. She, she's so good at putting things in pictures form for us to understand of the tribe of this month, Manasseh of the promises of this month, of what it's about. What did Manasseh have? What, did, what was the gift of that tribe? Last month was Ephraim. This month was Manasseh. Both are sons of Yosef. Both adopted to be direct sons of Israel, right? But what about us Gentiles? What about us who cannot trace a biological bloodline lineage where do we fit in? I've actually heard it said, well, what are your gifts and pick a tribe? I actually had someone tell me that. Well, pick a tribe. Join whatever tribe you want to. Really? No, I don't think that's quite how it works. <laughs> Did you know that someone who converts to Judaism is not assigned to a tribe? They're not. A convert to Judaism... Now, they may join the house of the rabbi they convert under and through. They join that household of faith, but they don't necessarily join that same tribe. When you convert, you get to pick a name. You get to pick a Jewish name, a Hebrew name, a name that identifies who you are as a child, a son, or a daughter of Israel. But you don't pick your parentage. You don't get to say, oh, I want to be a daughter of Reuben. You don't get to do that. What is said is exactly what Moshe was calling you up to today. You are a son or a daughter of Avraham. You get to bypass Israel. Go right to Avraham, the father, the founder of the faith. In, in being a convert, we leave prior heritage we leave our family before, we are going to become different. And some of you, some of us know what it means to be marked as different now because we've started to observe the Shabbat. And how many of you have had struggles with your family over that? <laughs> All right? And, and, and it takes a while for the family to kind of adjust to that. My family's had to adjust the fact that if you want to do a kid's birthday, don't do it at noon on Saturday. Grandma won't be there. Check with me first. I might be able if it's an evening, but not during the day. And they've been really, they've gotten better at it and better at it and better at it. And for a while there, it was like I, I had to set my phone on, 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 on um, airplane mode simply because people call you, right? We've had that problem more than once. I just set it on airplane mode now. People are learning. There's a place where Elizabeth is on Saturday morning, and it's not ready to answer the phone. In being a convert, you leave all the prior heritage. You change, and it is as if when you come up out of the mikvah. Does anyone know what a mikvah is? Who knows what a mikvah is? It is a water baptism. Mikvah is a baptism. When you come up out of the waters of the mikvah, when you have been baptized into, you are not baptized into Moses. You are not baptized into a tribe. You come up born again as a child of Abraham. The concept of being born again is not a Christian idea. I know that's what we all think. It's what we've all been taught. It's what we've all understood. But the concept of being born again, the concept of being baptized and that being bringing about a new birth is not a Christian idea. It comes totally out of Judaism. 
Conversion means that you, if you're male, get to be circumcised. How fun is that? I'm glad I'm a woman. <laughs> and then you go through the waters of the mikvah or the baptism. Women, we go through the waters of the baptism too. To convert, you have to go through the, you have to be born again by the waters of the mikvah. But when we come up, we are then called sons and daughters of Abraham. So who are the sons and daughters of Abraham? We have those that are born in the household, right? That's part of what we read about today. Those that are born in your household, Abraham, they will be part of this covenant. And then there are those who later choose to be part of it. We see that even in the lineage of Yeshua, as was read, where we have Tamar. She was not of that lineage. She was a Gentile. But she walked in faith with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then we have... Um, I, I, Rahab, who was Rahab? Anyone remember who Rahab was? Yeah, she, she, she was on the wall of Jericho. She kept an inn on the wall of Jericho. She was an innkeeper. Innkeepers were not considered, um, especially if you were a woman and you kept an inn, you weren't necessarily considered to be a woman of high reputable standing. Some believe that she was a prostitute and that it was a house of prostitution. And it's possible. Whatever she was, wherever she was at before, when she saw Israel, when she saw what was happening, when the spies came into the city of Jericho, she said, I want to be a part of what you guys are a part of. I like your God. <laughs> I choose to be a part of you. She was a Gentile. The next Gentile in our list is really ex exceptional because her name was Ruth. Where was she from? Moab. 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 Who was told not to be allowed to be in the house of Israel? The Moabites. <laughs> Abraham said so. It's in the Torah. It's in the law. And yet, we see Ruth, a Moabitess, who follows Naomi into the house, into her home, goes back to Bethlehem with her and says, your God is my God. Ruth was born again. She became a daughter of Abraham. She's in the lineage. I love the fact that we have three Gentiles, all women, <laughs> isn't that interesting? Who are in the lineage of King David. Then we have Solomon's situation. The wife of Uriah, Bathsheba. The first child they had together died, but the second child they had together became king of Israel, Solomon. God redeemed even that. Now she was of the household of Israel, but she was taken as a wife and rather not pure means, right? It wasn't good. But God, our God, is one who redeems and rescues and brings us in if we are willing to be brought in. And that's part of the key right there. You see, the promise given to Abraham and to Sarah In verse 3 of chapter 12 says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who curses you. And by you, how many families of the earth will be blessed? One or two or three or a few or more. It says all. All families. All families of the earth will be blessed. With Abraham and Sarah. All. I don't think that leaves anybody out. Then we have in Bereshit 17, 
And, and I've got them highlighted on this other paper. That's how come I keep looking over here. <laughs> We've got it in verse 5. It says, I have made you the father of how many nations? Two? Three or four? Fourteen? You see, many people read this, and because, because we have of, and we know that from, from Isaac comes the 12 tribes, right? And we have from Ishmael, it says there are 12 nations that come from Ishmael. We'll see that later. So that's that's not just one or two nations, right? That's that's the, the sons of the of the promise, which are one nation, because Israel was one nation. They were supposed to be one nation. But then you have twelve come out of the other son, right? Ishmael. But this doesn't say thirteen nations. In fact, the um the word in the Hebrew is one of those words that is an exponential word. It means many, 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 many nations. Not just a few, not just one, not just two, not just a handful, not just this, but more than you understand, more than you can count. He is to be the father of many nations. He says that to Sarah too. She will be, in verse 16, I will bless her. Moreover, I will give her a son by you. Truly, I will bless her. She will be the mother of nations. Again, it's the same exponential word. Kings of peoples. Peoples. Not just this family or this family or that family. Not just, but many, many people groups. Many tribes, many groupings, many societies, many cultures. She will be their mother. It's not limited. We think it's limited, but it's not. It's not limited. So the question is, how do all of these become children of Abraham? Since lineage is important, right? Since the bloodline is important, but you know, the bloodline is only one part of it. What if someone in, in his household rejects the circumcision? What does it say about that person? Cut off. They're cut off. It means they're no longer part of the household. If someone walks away from the covenant, turns their back on the covenant, they're no longer part of the covenant. They're not part of the family. They've turned their back on it. This is one of the reasons that in Jewish families over the centuries, as someone accepts Yeshua, if the family they come from doesn't recognize that, doesn't see him as Jewish, doesn't, they start looking, oh, you're serving another God. You've rejected the covenant of Abraham. You're no longer our son or our daughter. It has cost a lot to come from that lineage, to accept Messiah Yeshua. So for those of us who complain about Sabbath costing us and our observance of the Sabbath costing us things, think about what it costs someone who was raised in an observant Jewish household or an Orthodox Jewish household or even one that's not. Because you see, you can be anything you want to be in Judaism and still be considered Jewish. You can turn to Buddha. You can believe in reincarnation. You can do all these other things. You can become an... You, you, you can... You can do all that, and it's okay, you're still Jewish. But if you name Yeshua HaMashiach as your rabbi, as your master, as the one who is the Messiah of Israel, quite often you are cut off. I've talked to a few whose cost has been great, very great, because it's, they think that it means that they've been cut off from Israel, that they have rejected the covenant don't understand. What they've done is they've accepted the next part of the covenant. They've recognized the covenant and they've said, oh, and look, the promise of that covenant is here in Yeshua. He's the promise of that covenant. He's, he's the reward. He's the one that it's talking about. He's the one it's showing. He's the one it's looking to. He is 
the covenant. In Luke, this, this I didn't have y'all look up, but in Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, it says this. And this is John, the baptizer, right? No, not John the Baptist, because he wasn't a Baptist. Baptist churches didn't exist yet. Um, growing up a Baptist, I actually kind of, as a little kid, was like, oh, he was a Baptist, cool. <laughs> no, he wasn't. <laughs> John was the baptizer. He was calling people out. He was challenging them, those of his generation. And in verse 3, verse 7, there were crowds coming to him. Even those of the priesthood, even those of the Levitical order, they were coming out to him. And John said to the crowds who came out to be immersed by him, you snakes. That's not a nice thing, is it? Um, so people who tell you that you have to be nice and loving to everybody, John wasn't. By the way, neither was Yeshua. But anyway. Yohanan said to the crowds who came out to be immersed by him, you snakes who warned you to escape the coming punishment, if you have really turned from your sins, produce the fruit that will prove it. And don't start saying to yourselves, Abraham is my father. For I tell you that God can raise up for Abraham sons from these stones. Already the axe is at the root of the trees, ready to strike. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown in the fire. The axe is at the root, ready to strike it down. And if you're not producing fruit, so does being a son of Abraham by lineage, is that what God wants of us? Is that what is required to please God? According to Jean Yohanan, it's not enough. It's not enough. There has to be repentance. There has to be works of righteousness. And he's not talking about just the external, I go to church every Sunday. We all know people like that, right? I go to church on Sunday. I pray over my meal at every restaurant. And I always leave a track for a tip. Now, if you're going to leave a track for a tip for a waitress, leave a really good cash tip. Yeah. Make it cash, not on the credit card, because they get taxed on that. Big. If you're going to leave a witness of Yeshua, leave it with love. Otherwise, I will tell you what waitresses do. I know, because I was one. They pick it up, they look at it, they watch you walk it out to your car, and they go... <laughs> Stupid Christians. This isn't going to help me. They wad it up and they throw it in the garbage. Why? Because you've insulted them. God says, act like a Christian. Act like a believer. Act like a child of Abraham. One of the things we know about Abraham was he was generous. He was generous. And he was welcoming. And it says he ran to those he saw on the road. He had his tents open. And he was generous. So if you're going to be a child of Abraham, you have to be generous. You have to be and do what Abraham did. You have to do, be what he was and do what he did. If you want to be his son. If you want to be his child. What did he do besides generosity? What did he do besides being repentant when he did something wrong or if he did something wrong? We know that. Hebrews 11. Let's see where I'm at in my notes. Don't want to get too far off. Yeah. Hebrews 11, verses 8, beginning at verse 8. Y'all know I don't just read one verse. I can't pick and choose a verse. And the reason for that is we have done enough picking and choosing in verses to support anything we wanted to support. And if you take them one, one at a time and you take them out, you know, um, was it the, the example I was given when I was in Bible college a long time ago was this. You, you can take this part of this verse and this part of this verse and this part of this verse, right? 
you can take the part of the verse that says that um, that that um, Judas went out and hanged himself, and the next verse you pick up says, "Go thou and do likewise." You could be in big trouble, guys. Don't pick and choose verses. It's got to fit in the context, right? Hebrews eleven, verse eight. Wrong chapter. There we are. Now my verse, my version says trusting. Your version might say through faith. Trust and faith are the same thing, basically. If you have faith, then you trust. If you don't have faith in someone, you don't trust them, right? So having faith in someone is the same as trusting them. By trusting, Abraham obeyed after being called to go out to a place which God would give him as a possession. Indeed, he went out without knowing where he was going. By trusting, he lived as a temporary resident in the land of promise, as if it were not even his. Staying in the tents with Yitzhak and Yaakov, who were to receive what was promised along with him. He was looking forward to the city with permanent foundations of which the architect and builder is God. By trusting, he received potency to father a child even when he was past the age for it, as was Sarah herself, because he regarded the one who had made the promise as trustworthy. By faith, by trusting what God said, Abraham acted on it, right? He didn't just say, oh, God said do that, that's nice. Well, God, when you do that, da, 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 then I'll do that. When I get title to the land, when, when you send me that in the mail, then I'll go move on it. Right? <laughs> That's not what he did. God said, this is going to be your land. This is going to be your place. Get up and go. Without knowing even where he was going. God hadn't even told him which direction. He hadn't told him anything yet. By faith. He got up and he went. Galatians. I'm going to be all over the place, guys. Galatians chapter 3. Because I want us to understand this. This isn't a one book idea. This isn't a one part idea. This is, this is all of it. Galatians chapter 3. Starting in verse 6. Now, I'm just going to read it first. Well, I'm going to go back to verse 5 because I can. What about God who supplies you with the Spirit and works miracles among you? Does he do it because of your legalistic observances of the Torah? Or because you trust in what you've heard and you're faithful to it? It was the same with Abraham. He trusted in God. He was faithful to him. And that was credited to his account as righteousness be assured then that it is those who live by trusting and being faithful who are truly the children of abraham the tanakh foreseeing that god would consider the gentiles righteous when they live by trusting and being faithful told this good news to abraham in advance by saying in connection with you all the nations will be blessed so then those who rely on trusting and being faithful are blessed along with Abraham who was trusted, who trusted and was faithful. He trusted. He trusted. What, what gives us righteousness? What we do? Romans 4. Yeshua, by the way, told them, told them at one point, there were, every single gospel has a place where they are told, you know, don't claim to be a son of Abraham if you're not going to do the deeds and do the works of Abraham. Being a son biologically of Abraham gets you nothing if you don't. You're not going to be like Abraham. 
Romans chapter 4. Come on, I read it out of this book. There it is. <laughs> Romans chapter 4, verse 4. Oh, wait a minute. Let me go back to verse 1. I like doing that. I back up on you all the time, don't I? Verse 1, chapter 4 of Romans. Then what should we say of Abraham, our forefather, obtained by his own efforts? For if Abraham came to be considered righteous by God because of legalistic observances, then he has something to boast about. But the same restaurant owner has a daughter who comes in and works. Is she working because he hired her? Or is she working because she's his daughter? She may even get paid the same. But why is she there? What benefit does she have over the one that came in off the street? I tell you what benefit she has, because I've seen it in action. Probably you guys have too. If something goes down and it's wrong, who gets in trouble? The biological daughter or the gal that was hired off the street? Whose word is he going to believe? If money's missing from the till, whose word are they going to believe and why? We believe our bloodline, right? We believe our children. When we take children in on a business venture and we start training them and, we, and they're, they're looking at it from a different perspective than someone who's hired off the street. Why? Because they're related to the owner. This place might actually become mine someday. I better really learn how to do it. I better learn how to do it the right way. I better understand it. And not only that, but I need to work positively toward this because this is my inheritance, right? At least that's the way my friend was raised. Her dad used to tell her that all the time. This will be yours someday. Because when I retire... It's yours. Now you can either help us build it up or you can tear it down. But either way, this is your inheritance. So choose wisely. <laughs> she did. She chose very wisely. She built it up really well with him. And then when he retired, she sold it and went and did what she wanted to do. Um, <laughs> you don't have to be locked into things, right? When we are working to earn our income, we work a certain way, right? But when we are working because we love the person we're working for, because we are helping the person we're working for, because it's just a part of our a relationship, right? We work differently. At this point in life, a lot of us are involved in elder care. Some of us because it's our parents. And it's people we love. Some of us get hired to do it. And it's not somebody we know, but we want to love them and we want to care for them. I will tell you honestly, as truthfully, as someone who loves the person you're taking care of in a family matter, you take care of them differently than the person that's hired off the street. Doesn't matter how good they are, what background checks they've passed, doesn't matter what references they have, you are going to look at your parents as you care for them differently then they will. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's not good. Because sometimes we need that objective. But the point I'm trying to make is that if I'm part of the family and I am doing these things, I'm doing them from a different place than someone who's just hired in to do it. Someone who's hired in to do it is doing it because they want to earn something. They want to earn something. This one's doing it because they love. They love. The same thing is true in the household of faith. There are people who do to get, who do because they want to earn, who do because they want credits. They want to be looked at a certain way or they want to earn respect or they want to earn, they want to, in the worst case is they think they're going to earn salvation because God's going to take all of this account and he's going to take my good deeds and my bad deeds and he's going to weigh them against each other. So I got to do enough good deeds so that my good deeds are way more, right? You've heard that. I've heard that said by others. That's not how God judges. It's not how he judges. Doing good deeds to earn the approval of God is going to be frustrating. It's going to be hard. 
it ends up being a challenge. And basically, I, I have never seen it work. However, if by faith, because you have accepted and recognized God as God, if by faith you step into this place, then when we walk in obedience, it's for a different reason, isn't it? It's because we love him. It's because we want to please him. It's because I want my relationship with him to be unhindered. So I'm going to be different. I'm going to do things different. Not because I want to earn anything, but because I want him to know I love him. And I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And I want to express my love to him. So the way I do things is going to be different than the way the person is doing it who thinks they have to earn it. In Isaiah, God tells the people, verse 30, Young men may grow tired and weary, the fittest may stumble and fall, but those who hope, those who trust, those who have faith, and Adonai will renew their strength. They will soar aloft as with eagle's wings. And when they're running, they won't grow tired. When they're walking, they won't get tired. When they're running, they won't grow weary. When they're walking, they won't get tired. You see, if we have hope and faith in God, and if we are doing this out of hope, out of faith, out of trust, then he will give us the strength we need to do the walking, to walk it out to understand salvation, to work it out, to demonstrate it. But if we don't hope in him, if we don't trust in him, if we don't have faith, it just becomes a bunch of lists of do's and don'ts. And we look at it from the perspective of, oh, I can't have any fun if I want God to be happy with me. And we forget the fact, the joy that God gives. And by the way, he likes fun. <laughs> And he gives us fun. Verse 8, chapter 41 of Isaiah, Meshiachu. You, Israel, my servant, Yechav, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Avraham, my friend. I have taken you from the ends of the earth, summoned you from the distant parts, and said to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you, not rejected you. I understand and I recognize this is written to Israel. This is a promise given to the direct descendants, the bloodline of Israel, Yechov. This is given to them specifically. But if I am grafted in, if I choose to become a daughter of Avraham, then it applies to me too. By applying it to me, I am not at all saying it doesn't still apply to Israel as a nation, because it does. But as one who has chosen, who has fallen in love with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I can look at this and say, yes, this is for me too. You see, I have chosen to become a child of God. In James chapter 2, verses 12 through 24, out of the, I'm going to read it out of the Tree of Life version. It says, What good is this, my brothers and sisters, if someone says they have faith but does not have works? Can such faith fa save them? If your brother or sister is naked and lacks food, and one of you says, Go in peace, stay warm, be fed but you don't give them what they need, what good is that? So also faith. This is an example he gives us of faith. Faith that does not have any works is dead in and of itself. Someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. And I don't know about you, but I've heard that. Show me your faith without your works. 
and I'll show you faith by my works. You see, faith and works are two sides of the same coin. What have we been saved to? We've been saved to the good deeds that God has given us in Yeshua. We've been saved to do something. I love this. You believe that God is one. You do well. <clears throat> the demons also believe and shudder. <laughs> but do you want to know, you empty person, faith without works is dead. Wasn't our father Abraham proved righteous by works when he offered up his Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see, faith worked together with his works, and by the works, his faith was made complete. It's two sides of the same coin. It's not a one or the other, guys. The scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. We see a man is proved righteous by his works, not by faith alone. If I say I have faith, but nothing in me has ever changed, I want to ask you a question. Do you really have faith? Because if I really have faith, Something is going to change. We are not made righteous by the works that we do. And that's not what this passage is saying. This passage is saying God makes us righteous and then we do the works God has called us to do. The fact that we've had faith and he has given us righteousness gives us the ability to do what he's called us to do. And that feeds the faith, which feeds the the work which feeds the faith. It's, it's a cycle, guys. The more I trust God, the more I step out in trust, the more he strengthens my trust, the more I can step out and trust, the more he'll strengthen my trust, the more I can step out and trust. Does that make sense? It goes together. Our works, our actions, the way we are, and the way we interact and the way we do things demonstrates the level of faith that we have. There's a time that God came to Abraham and he said, go to the place I will show you. And Abraham got up and did that, right? Abraham chose to do it because of him we're blessed because he chose to do it there was a later time when God said take the son I gave you the son of promise take him up on that mountain and sacrifice him that's a different level of faith than going to a new land isn't it it's a different place in faith some of us believed God at this level, and we've been at this level a while, but God is telling us to step and do something more, right? As we obey, he gives us more and more until our faith is proved not just externally, but internally. Because you see, God wants us to understand that we trust him. Why? Because then we can recognize that he has changed us. When we choose to hear God's call on our lives and we choose to obey it, we become his children. We become the children of Abraham by faith. We are grafted in as a child, son or daughter of Abraham, not Moses. Abraham, he's our father. We can choose to be his child. And in fact, we should choose to be his child. Have you ever chosen to be a child of Abraham? Is there a place that God has taken you to now that's saying, okay, I'm bringing you to a different level. Are you still going to have faith? Are you going to have more faith? Are you going to grow deeper in that faith? There's a stupid little chick flick 
I, a, a movie that I watched with my daughters a long time ago. Some of you have probably seen it. Julie Andrews is in it. That was one of the reasons I watched it. The Princess Diaries, right? At the beginning, the queen of this country comes and she finds this girl who's been raised in America, who's kind of been raised by a mom who's a free spirit person, and, and she's kind of an, she doesn't fit in anywhere, you know? This girl does not fit in anywhere. Nobody seems to like her. She doesn't fit. She doesn't know who she is. Doesn't know what she's supposed to do. She's failing at everything. She's, and then all of a sudden this woman shows up and looks at her and says, your father is a king. He's the king of this country. Not only that, but he's died. And because you are his only heir, now you are queen. And we need you to train and we need you to learn how to behave as a queen in our country and come back and be coronated. And this girl goes, what? She goes to her mom says, what? Mom goes, well, yeah, that did happen. I, yeah, yes, your biological father was. You told, whatever she had been told, you know, it doesn't matter. Because now she knows her father is the king. And she has to learn how to be royalty. So she's taken in, and they start tutoring her. Have, how many of you have seen this movie? If you haven't, watch, watch it again and watch for this. She's being trained. She's learning the stuff. She's struggling with it. She's having a hard time with it. They do this big dinner, and she does something I did when I was a teenager. Cracks me up because I did this. My dad took me to a $50 a plate political dinner thing. I was all dressed up formal and all this stuff and sat there and you know what I did? I went to cut my steak and I went like that and the steak went under the floor. <laughs> I was mortified. And the person sitting to my left reached over, kicked it under, cut theirs in half and gave me half of theirs real fast. <laughs> They saved me, right? From that and all that. But when she she spilled, she knocks something over, she trips, she knocks this, and it becomes this she she wasn't saved by anybody in, in this film, was she? Everything kind of collapses. And she runs out of the room in absolute tears. I'll never be the queen. I can't learn this stuff. I am klutzy. I can't do this. I can't do that. Look, I just destroyed this entire thing. I ruined it all. Her grandmother sits her down and says, honey, I want to tell you something. I don't care if you never learn how to dance nicely. I don't care if you learn which fork to use. I don't care if you know how to do all this stuff. That, you, I, I don't, that doesn't matter. Because the reality is, whether you learn all this nice stuff or not, you're still the daughter of the king, and you will still be queen. Whether you do it right or not is immaterial. You will still be the queen. Come. And there's a shift that takes place in her brain. In the mind of the young girl, all of a sudden she recognizes who she is. And it internalizes it. I'm the daughter of the king. I really am the queen. Oh. And when she internalizes it, all of a sudden she seems to begin to develop the grace that she couldn't develop before because now she's not walking in, I gotta learn this. Now she's walking in the confidence of knowing who she is. Did you know that we can walk in the confidence of knowing who we are and not worry about all this little piddly stuff we do or don't do? If we will walk in the confidence of who we are as sons and daughters of Abraham, sons and daughters of faith, We stop struggling with little things and we just literally start being the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, which is what it says we are and what it says we have. Have you chosen to be a child of faith? Having chosen to be a child of faith, have you recognized what that means? Because that's my challenge this week. If you've not chosen, 
then talk to Moshe, talk to me, Let, talk to Chris, talk to Bob. We can lead you in this place of knowing that you've chosen. Because first we have to choose, but then we just are. If you need help internalizing that, let us know. Let us pray for you, pray with you, talk to us. But otherwise, I just want you all to know that you are sons and daughters of Abraham by faith, that you are sons and daughters of the king of eternity. Because by faith, when we're grafted into Abraham, we're grafted directly into God through Yeshua, through Yeshua. Because you see, he is the fulfillment of the covenant that Abraham had. So we choose to follow Yeshua in faith, and he will give us that righteousness. Father, I want to thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the confidence I have to stand up here and say, if I will have faith in the one you sent, then you will bring me into the family of faith, into the, to be a son or daughter of Abraham. I will have faith in the one you sent, in Yeshua, if I will walk in that faith, you will honor it. Thank you. It's nice being the child of the king. And it makes such a difference, Lord. Father, as we are tested, as we are challenged, as we are growing, as we are developing that faith to walk it out, I ask you to give us each the strength of where we are at right now for that next step, that next level, that next part. Whether it's time to leave the family we were part of or whether it's time to sacrifice our only son, Lord, you know where we are. Help us with that next step. As we declare on faith in you, help us walk it out. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. Moshe, would you come and dismiss us? shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Hey! Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat 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 shalom, 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 Shabbat shalom,